Welcome back to the second session of the day. Teamwork Arts in association with the Consul General of India in Houston, Asia Society Texas Center and Imprint welcome you to this session of JLF Houston Virtual Festival. Each of us writers, diaspora and displacement, Jenny Bott and Mimi Lok in conversation with Milanjana Banerjee, presented by Indiaspora. Identities morph and change with borders and geographies. How do diasporic writers address displacement-driven themes of rootlessness, marginalization, fragmentation, alienation, isolation, nostalgia, assimilation, acculturalization, adaptation, multiculturalism, and more in their fiction? How do they choose whose stories to tell? How do they navigate their own quests to belong given their cultural loyalties? As diasporic writers in the US, Ginny Bott and Mimi Lok will speak to Neil and Jenna Bat Banerjee on how displacement, whether physical or cultural or both, has shaped their storytelling and their own identities as writers. Jenny Bott is a writer, literary translator, and book critic. She's also the host of Desi Books podcast. Her story collection, Each of Us Killers, was out in September 2020, and her Gujarati to English translation, Ratnodoli Dunkito's Best Stor Short Stories, was released in October 2020. Mimi Luck is the author of the story collection, Last of Her Name, which won the 2020 Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize and the California Book Award Silver Medal. She is currently working on a novel, and Locke is also the co-founder of Voice of Witness, a nonprofit that amplifies marginalized voices. Milan Jana Banerjee is the managing editing editor of Kaya Press, an independent publishing house dedicated to Asian diasporic literature. Her poetry, fiction, and essays have appeared in Prairie Schooner, Chicago Quarterly Review, and The Rumpus, and many other places. She teaches writing and liter literature at UCLA and Loyola, Loyola Marymount University. We are delighted to have Lanchora as the podcast partner for this session. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A, so please feel free to send in your questions. And all of our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Do follow our pages at JLF Lit Fest across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to be notified of the upcoming sessions. And stay tuned to jlflitfest.org slash Houston for the full schedule and information about our speakers. In these unusually difficult times, Teamwork Arts has worked to bring you JLF Houston without charging a registration fee. Please donate as generously as you can to ensure a free and seamless and continuous flow of knowledge. You can donate on the website jlflitfest.org slash Houston. Ladies and gentlemen, we present each of us writers, diaspora and displacement. Milanjana, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, it's, it's, I'm so excited to be here in conversation with Jenny and Mimi this morning. Uh, I am so excited that the Jaipur Festival is transnational, global all over the world now, but I do also wish that Jenny, Mimi, and I were sitting in a palace in Jaipur right now, uh, having this conversation and then going off to uh, tour the, the sites. Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested in this having these two writers in conversation, uh, Jenny's book, Each of Us Killers, and Mimi's book, Last of Her Name, two short story collections, I feel are, are really in conversation. They're both writers who are whose uh, careers, uh, previous careers, lives up until these beautiful collections seem to have have taken them uh, all over the world, really uh, making their 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 stories uh, embrace this idea of diaspora. Um, so I, I thought I, we could start with that really kind of, you know, asking you both to, to talk about your your journey, journeys and identities towards this collection. What does what does that, that, that idea of a diasporic identity mean to you? And, and how did it lead you towards these these books? Maybe Jenny, you can start. Oh, sure. Thank you, Nilanjana. And thank you, Jayla, for, for having us on this um, panel. So, you know, this topic is obviously, as, as Nilanjana said, um, very close to my heart, certainly, because as, as you've said, you know, I've moved around a lot. And I left India, so I grew up in India, I left India at the age of 18. And I went first to the UK, where I was studying engineering. So I wasn't a writer from the beginning. Um, I had a whole different career in, in engineering and then traveled a lot because of that. Um, 
and I ended up in Silicon Valley for about seven years before I left there as well. But one of the things that I always found because of all the moving around a lot, whether it was the UK or Germany or Scotland, I was just moving around for work, you know, not, not my own choice necessarily. You sort of get used to not belonging, right? You get used to always kind of being the outsider. And I think what, what that does it, it, it's, there's good and bad. What that does to you as a writer, because I was always writing also throughout that time, I just wasn't publishing, but I've always wanted to be a writer. So I was always writing, I was taking the odd writing workshop or whatever, right? So what that does to you as a writer, not belonging and not feeling like you're part of, because you, 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 you become this kind of um, mongrel identity where you don't belong to what you've left behind, which is, I, I, I felt, separated from the India that I'd grown up in, but I also didn't feel like I was necessarily British Asian because I hadn't grown up there. There were cultural nuances that I didn't know. I didn't go to school there. I went to university, but not to high school. And so, um, but I think what that does is when you come to your writing as a diasporic writer and that rootlessness and that sense of not belonging, you are looking at things as if with new eyes each time you were maybe seeing things that people who've grown up and lived in the culture maybe just take as a given. So I think that was the positive aspect of being a diasporic writer for me, certainly. I would notice things, I would find things interesting that perhaps for others they would just take for granted or, you know. Um, so certainly that's kind of one of the reasons, one of the things that fueled my writing, because I would see these things that would just, I'd be like, why is it this way? Why does it have to be this way? What is the meaning of this? And then, you know, it raises questions, and then your writing is the way for you to explore those questions. And so, yeah. Awesome. Mimi? Um, a lot of what you've just said, Jenny, really resonates with me too. Um, I think in, in my case, uh, I didn't spend any time growing up in my parents' uh, home country, um, China. So I think that I don't think I ever had a real sort of um, uh, sense of a proper place growing up because I was always growing up with dual cultures and often, you know, I think the question of loyalty came up. And so that was always confusing for me whenever the Olympics came on. I, I wasn't really sure what the route was. Yeah, UK, yay, or China, yay, or some other tiny country that's sort of surprising everybody. And I sometimes found myself rooting for that third option. But um, I think that similar to what Jenny said, it's um, feeling as if you don't fully, fully belong in one place or culture does, um, does put you on the margins or in sort of like an in-between sort of place but I think it's it is also a sort of a superpower as well you get to observe things from different vantage points and then also looking for connections and I think you're I think um perhaps Jenny and Neela you can also relate to this experience as well things that only really exist with a certain specificity in one language or culture not exist in the other so you find yourself constantly translating as well, especially when you're trying to communicate um, an experience or an emotion that only has an English word for it or, or a Chinese word for it or a colloquial um, Chinese word for it. That um, So uh, yeah, it's just really interesting. And I think it just, it does, um, it does end up forming a certain Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about it all week as I've been leading up to this, but I think your both of both of your experiences are especially interesting in, in these collections because you have multiple identities. You both said you, you know, you, you spent time in the UK. Now you both live uh, in, in the United States of America, um, and that's where your writing has, has really come to be, but both of your do uh, encompass these this this transnational view and i think 
it's it's so powerful to to think about that now as if as we look back at certain um, ways that that fiction is often organized that it oh that you know it's very localized we we know that that's this is kind of the history of, of certain kinds of ways that people you know talk about fiction oh it's oh it's all in one town but your stories both of your stories um move across the world um, from the uk to india to to hong kong all you know they they take on these these multiple spaces which i think is, is really exciting so i guess i think what is it you know for you both to be now writing as a, in america is that does that something that you think gives a, a specific uh you know kind of focus to your writing or is that just a place that you ended up well i mean yeah so to me I, i certainly write with more western sensibilities um even though i'm writing when i'm writing about story you know stories that are set in india i'm talking about indian values indian culture maybe but my sensibilities you can't help how you've evolved as a person right if you've lived in the west long enough and so for me um my awareness of let's say you know the inequalities in in society whether it's class or gender or race or uh, caste which is more prevalent in in india but also in the indian american population or south asian american population in the us um certainly my sensibilities are are very much about being aware of what those fault lines do for us and my my collection like you rightly said is set across multiple countries um that the unifying theme in my case is working lives so i'm exploring with each character their workplace um what are the conflicts that they're dealing with in their workplace each story deals with one particular character in their workplace the conflict or issue in their workplace whether it's driven by class or caste or gender or race and i think for me um writing when whenever the whenever the setting changed whether it was in india or whether it was um in the us i wanted to make sure that i was although my sensibilities were western i wanted to make sure that the choice of place when i decided okay i'm going to write about a yoga instructor but i'm going to set the story in india versus in the us it was a very deliberate choice because a yoga instructor in the us there are all kinds of other issues about appropriation and all you know there's a whole set of different issues that i would be looking at if i was to have a yoga instructor in at their workplace in the us versus a yoga instructor in india and so i had to be very specific when i was saying okay i want to write about a character who has this kind of job and then i would say but yes but what are the issues i want to explore or understand and given that does it make sense to set the story so place the setting and and the location geographic location was very important because there are certain cultural nuances that change depending on your geographic location right so mm. yeah. yeah i'm really interested mimi i don't actually think i've ever asked you this question but do you consider yourself a, an american writer i mean you've lived in america for a long time um i don't know i mean <laughs> <laughs> i guess i'll say yes just to be eligible for certain things <laughs> but, <laughs> but um i don't know um I don't I mean when people call me an Asian American writer I think fine some of calls me a British Chinese writer fine that's totally fine um I um I think to answer your question uh I have stories set in Hong Kong and China and and then also the UK and in the US and across different time periods and uh and across different classes as well and um and in I think when I have a Chinese character in the UK or the US there is this um even if the displacement or diaspora um element isn't necessarily there with a capital D it's it's there just in terms of the way that they they to sort of you know just that 
the way that they, they move themselves through through their world and it comes up in in different ways and different emphasis and then I think in in the stories that are set in Hong Kong or China it's um the and displacement is more within the, the their society and it might be more about gender or it might be more about class or um and sometimes it's this internal emotional sense of disconnection and and displacement as well and so I I didn't know that I was writing about displacement until <laughs> until um until my editor your colleague Sun Young Lee Neela uh helped me see some of the themes that were present in all of my stories so I think it's I think this also speaks to how in some cases you can have a really clear sense of what unifies your writing or the writing within a collection and I think in my in my case it uh, those themes only emerged after that during the process of of choosing stories and what went together and and um and trying to sort of understand at least in in Sun Young's case uh who edited my book with me um she we had these conversations because she really wanted to understand what compelled me to write she really wanted to understand my writing and so I thought oh yeah I, I do write a lot about people who are out of, <laughs> who are out of place and you know, disconnected it's not you know it's, it's almost I guess it's as natural as breathing so I didn't really think about it until putting together that collection if I'm being totally honest yeah. I think what's so, first of all, just I, I keep thinking about what you said, Mimi, at the beginning of this, that you guys are, that the, the multiple border crossing and the displacements make you superheroes. And I, I love that idea. And I love this idea that the books, um, the stories in the books cross all these borders. They cross, you know, some different kinds of stories, um, but you know, they all are short stories. I know you both probably are working on other things, but I was so fascinated because not only do they cross multiple uh, borders, they're from around the world, but they also are in, in various sizes. They're not just the kind of um, average, you know, short story, 10 to 20 page short story. I think if, if you put it in, in a range from, um, you know, Jenny's to Mimi's stories, there's short stories, there's one to two page stories, um, there's, you know, kind of that traditional length story. And then, of course, in Mimi's collection, we even titled it as as such. It's a collection plus a novella. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I love I love that. And I, I so I'm really interested in in, in that both how how it was for you, for you all you know why why the short story it, why the short story um, why is that your form and um, can you talk a little bit both about you know these these different sizes of sh stories and whether that was uh, you know complicated when you were trying to put this collection together and and sell it um. Yeah, uh, so for me, I've always loved the short story form. I used to write a monthly column on the short story for years. And um, I think also because a lot of my formal writing education, if you like, happened in the US. And a lot of the tradition in terms of writing workshops or MFAs, you know, they tend to, it, it, the short story form lends itself to that kind of workshop environment as well. So probably I, I was drawn more to it for that reason. But then I think with this collection, because I was focused on, um, so I, I had given up my full-time career in Silicon Valley to become a writer, right? And so for me, there was a lot going on in my head about how much work means to us personally and how that's such an important part of our identity, especially if you don't have anything else, you know, um, like you're not a mother or, you know, something else. So, you know, work is who you are when you introduce yourself to people and people say, who, what do you do? And I found myself suddenly after giving up my job as not having that, that identity anymore. And I hadn't published yet. And so people would ask me and I, I, there was a lot going on in my head about how much work had factored in my life and how much it was a part of my life. So when I started the stories, I didn't think of it, oh, I'm writing a collection about working lives, but it just naturally happened that I wanted to explore specific conflicts 
that come up in our working lives in the workplace. And so every story I wrote that became a running thread. And the reason the short story form helped me do that better than a novel is because I wanted to explore multiple kinds of conflicts and different, different people, you know, different people from different classes and different levels of society. And I didn't think I could do that in a big novel, um, which has more of a continuous link. Whereas, you know, this allowed me to explore, you know, as Graham Greene says, you know, that one singular life defining event or moment in a person's life from which you can look back on everything or look forward on everything. And I wanted that to me, it was like, okay, because I just had a life defining moment in my life by giving up my job and, you know, after the age of 40, starting this new career of writing. And so I wanted to explore those life defining moments. And I thought the short story form allowed me to do that better. Yeah, I think like Jenny, I've always really loved short stories. And, um, and I think for me, something that's really exciting as a reader and a writer is that when you when you start a novel there's a certain kind of set of expectations at the beginning and there's a there's this sort of unspoken contract between the writer and the reader that certain questions will get answered or certain expectations will be met to a certain degree and I think with the short story there's less of that I think as a reader I love being surprised I love ending up in a completely different place at the end of a story than at the beginning and um, we also being left with the feeling of what just happened there and then having to go right back to the beginning again. And I think as a writer, that gives me a certain certain kind of freedom to um, to not make everything fit as as um, as neatly. I think there's there, there are even though there are some stories that are longer or that are more ambitious and layered and you know lots of moving parts. I think there is just the container of a short story allows for a certain kind of focus and intensity and and I think adventure as well um, mm -hmm. and surprise and I don't know I mean I'm I think with the with the stories in my collection the you know from a two-page story to an 80-page novella that was I don't, I don't I didn't think about how long they would be going in it just felt very much like okay this is this is what this story needs and this is what this story needs and discovering that as you're going along and um and if it doesn't work just throw it out and start another one whereas <laughs> the novel is a little bit more of an investment of time um yeah so yeah and I, I loved I just love you know back to the intensity thing it's sort of like having this, this big soup and then you sort of boil it down to its concentrate so the, only the essential parts are there and it's sometimes Sometimes having that soup concentrate as a meal might be yeah. too much. It's just right in that small dose, or small to medium dose. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. and I think <clears throat> I think what to, to your to Mimi's point as well. I mean, I, in terms of form, Neela, I, I missed answering that part of your question. But yeah, I, my collection also has. You've got the two-page story, mm -hmm. and then you've got the eight thousand word. Um, and what I think is it allows, a collection allows that kind of play, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get to, ex I don't, you get to experiment a lot more with a collection. So in my case, I've, I've got, you know, I've taken a Gujarati folktale and subverted it. I've done a retelling of a Hindu myth and I've done the Twitter, st a Twitter story t style, you know, where it's only 280 characters of, you know, short stories. And so I've, I've been able to experiment a lot more. So I enjoyed that as both a challenge and a play thing, which I'm not saying you can't experiment with a novel, but I just, a collection allows more of that. Yeah. Mm. That's really and I think yeah. I really enjoyed what you what you mentioned, Jenny, about having uh, just exploring um, your oh, you know your your driving idea or questions through different experiences and perspectives. And I think that's the certain freedom that I like as well. Like you don't have to. I think, especially as a as a quote unquote minority writer, it's it can be it can feel sometimes like, like such a lot of pressure when you have. When you're writing a novel or you, and for it to represent 
everything that you wanted to say. And I think um, all that certain characters have to have to be a representative of that community or that kind of person. And I think when in the collection, they can just like for for me at least some of that pressure is off. And and I think sometimes. Sometimes what I really like about having a, sh a story collection that has some kind of glue to it, whether it's place or theme, or is that um, when I when I was writing my collection, it was um, you know there's a twelve year old British Chinese girl uh, in in the UK. There's this grandmother in Hong Kong who breaks into a house and lives there, and and then a bunch of other people in between. And I kept thinking of of their, their, it's, their, it's their situation and their the particular time and place and body in which they were born that 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 forms the the situation that or the scenario that makes for the story. And um and I kept thinking, well what if this person was born in the time and place of this character in this story, say 50 years later, or what if they were born male instead of female? And I kept thinking of um of the characters as different incarnations of each other you know it's just the it's just the, the twist of fate that they happen to be born for 50 years before their time so they could not be you know this female character can't be as sexually liberated as this her female counterpart 50 years in the future or in the present day and um and i think it's uh I think it's a really nice way to think about characters, but also about people as well, just thinking of each other as uh... I think there was a, a there was a stand-up comedian who said, Don't you think that if we walked around and if we looked at each stranger and 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 imagined them as ourselves reincarnated, mm. um, how we would treat that person differently? And I think that's quite quite a lovely thought. Yeah. That's that's great. You can I tell I've been spending time in California, right? I'm getting ready <laughs> to see you this morning. Um, <laughs> All the I, British I, kind of squeezed out of me. So. <laughs> I love that both of you were able to talk a little bit about some some of the stories in your collections. We hear we've heard about these different forms: a yoga teacher um, in India, the the homeless granny <laughs> um you know it's it's really great to to get a little bit of those 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 characters come through and i i think it's it they they are so interesting you know to to be able to 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 travel along with all of these people um is really exciting um what do you so this word displacement where where we have about 10 minutes or so a little less before we go into audience questions um what you know how and I'm, I'm really interested in a couple of things for you first Jenny um it I see that you've also been translating has that been uh something that you have that's always been a part of your writing process or something that you've come to lately tell us a little bit about what how your translation work kind of dovetails with your your fiction yeah no I was I came to translation just in the last few years really I I could certainly speak and read and write the language, Gujarati. I grew up, that's, that's my um, home, you know, that's the language we speak at home. Um, my mother was a big reader of Gujarati literature, but I wasn't. I didn't have any books in my own personal library. I read mostly, you know, Anglophone writing, obviously. Uh, when she passed away in 2014, I inherited her personal library. Um, and and I, I was still writing my own stories then. I was still trying to figure it out. 2017 is when I started, I felt like I had a collection and I started querying. And when I was querying, while I was waiting, I felt like, okay, just for fun, let me just take one of her favorite writers and translate a story just for my family. I wasn't doing it for anyone else. I'd never done a whole, you know, so I thought I'll just do that. And um, turns out an agent that I queried each of us killers with, he, he, was, he was in India and he said, you're a great writer, but short story collections don't sell, especially, you know, in India, they just don't, unless you're already an established writer, short story collections don't sell. And so, but but I noticed in your bio, you've mentioned that you like to translate. And so tell, send me three sample stories translated. And I hadn't even finished one. And so I, um, I said, okay, well, fair enough. Let me try that. And I did, and they 
snapped it up and it went to bid and auction and all of that good stuff in India. And I think it's because Dhumketu, the writer that I was translating, is an established writer. He had written 500 plus stories. He'd written some, you know, 40 plus novels. And so his, you know, doing an, a best of Dhumketu's stories translated was a great thing in India. But my own collection as a no-name writer, as a debut writer, was not, which is fine. That's the way it worked out. But um, to your question about displacement and how translation and all that works in, what I what I found was translation, it came after my writing, but I think it's made me a better writer. And, the, and what I mean by that is, when you're translating from, from language A to language B, you are paying such close attention to every word and every phrase, because you're trying, you're not just doing, you're not just taking a dictionary, right? You're not just translating, you're trying to make sure the cultural nuance, the writer's intention, there's a lot of things that you're trying to translate over from that language, from one language to the other. And so you're paying a very different kind of attention. I found myself engaging with the literary text in a very different way. And I, I do book criticism as well, so I write reviews. And that's another way of engaging with a text, right? With another writer's text. But the translation was giving me a different window into Gujarati culture, even though I grew up with it. But, but looking at it and trans, trying to translate it from one language to another language for a different audience, it, it made me question aspects of my own culture and aspects of my own received wisdom or accepted beliefs and values I was questioning everything. So no. this translation, the first book translation, I, I haven't even begun to unpack and write an essay about what it has meant to me. I, I need to do that at some point. I'd like to understand it for myself, but it has been quite a journey. And so to your question about displacement, I think from just a metaphorical uh, way, I feel like as a writer, I've gone from, I, I, I don't know where from where, but I've gone from X, place X to place Y because of the translation journey. That's really beautiful. Yeah, definitely get that essay out there. <laughs> um, for you, um, you're, you, in your bio, it says that you're working on a novel. You just talked about all the constraints of a novel. <laughs> How does it feel to, to make yeah. that, that, that kind of new, new journey into writing a novel? Yeah, can you tell it's going really, really well? Um... <laughs> no, I was <just> like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, short stories don't come easily to me either. But I think just because um, I thought, you know what, a novel isn't <clears throat> a novella isn't that many pages off from a novel, and and really, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't so much about oh, I want to write a novel because it's uh, because it's the uh, it's the ultimate goal. It's because I started this this story. Um, thinking it would just be a story and then realizing that it required more space and more words and pages and I was thinking oh, damn you I thought I'd, I'd, I'd be done with you sooner <laughs> so it was really about the story dictating um, a, a greater length and then it's as I was writing and then as soon as I realized that I just thought you know what okay, now I can just spread out and explore all these different digressions. And, and now it's about paring it back down again. And, um, and so, yeah, it's definitely been an interesting process. Um, I'm hard at work on that, on that beast. <laughs> are you, have you, uh, do you have a, a novel draft in there? Have you, are you, have you tried that longer form? Oh, is that for me? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I do have actually a work in process. And um, this is what I tell myself. A novel is just a collection of linked stories. That's how I've convinced myself I can write a novel. And that's the way I'm approaching it, to be quite honest. So it is, you know, it is a, a novel because it's about a particular character and a set of characters and the whole book, the whole story is about them. But I, I find myself still kind of being pulled back into the you know, short story approach. Um, and so I'm going to write it as a, as a set of linked stories to begin with, and then we'll figure out the nuts and bolts on how it's all going to play together. Um, 
So we, we have a couple of minutes till questions and I just wanted to, to bring it to this year, to this um, wild year that we're in. Jenny, you released two books, not, not just one, but two books in a pandemic. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, Mimi's book just came out in October, so she got kind of the first leg of of her tour out, and then you know has also gone virtual. So, what has it what has it been like to to release books in a pandemic and to be a, a writer at this time? Yeah, I obviously I didn't choose the dates of my publication necessarily, as you well know. Um, and and in my case, one book came out in the U.S. and one was in India, so I didn't I couldn't coordinate. Uh, I would not have, I will never recommend to anybody to bring out back-to-back -back books, even in a normal year. You just, there's no way you can keep up. I'm drinking from a fire hose, even as we speak. But um, it is what it is. And I, it's still a good problem to have. So I don't like to complain. Um, but yeah, I, I will say the one positive about this is the fact that with virtual events, I've been able to meet with writers and folks, literary people, from all over the world, like we're doing now. And so that's been the silver lining because as I don't think I could have done as many events if we were doing the physical book tour, right? I couldn't have afforded it. I couldn't have afforded the plane tickets and the accommodation and all of that. So I do think that that's been good, um, the virtual events. That said, I think we all know that virtual events don't necessarily sell books, that physical proximity to your audience with the hand selling and all of that, you, you, you do miss out on that. So I think just from a commercial standpoint this year, we've all had to work a lot harder, I think, um, to, to get our books out there. And there's been a lot of good books. And I'm reminded of something that just happened on Friday and it dropped onto literary social media, like a big ticking time bomb, which was the New York Times notable um, 100 notable books of 2020, which had only one short story collection on it, which God bless, that's a great collection. But when you think of the year that this year, the amazing number of short story collections that have come out. Um, so, so that should tell us how media attention has been. And in fact, the reason I started my podcast, They See Books, which is about books from South Asia or about South Asia uh, or by South Asian writers, I started it this year is because I have a lot of writer friends who have books out this year and freelance budgets were drying up at media venues, even at places like quite frankly, NPR and Washington Post. And I know cause I pitch book reviews. And so uh, I think a lot of writers have suffered this year because they couldn't get book reviews at the usual venues. And so it's been a tough year just in general. And I think Whatever we can do as literary citizens, I'm, I'm doing what I can to spotlight writers, I think need to be spotlighted, but yeah, it's a tough year. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna jump into all these great questions that we're getting. Um, so Alex asks Jenny, you know, what are some of the challenges of translating and is there a, a genre that you prefer now between translating and writing fiction? Oh, thank you. Um, challenges of translating. Well, it's always a challenge when you're translating from one language where you have colloquialisms and dialect, which is the case with this particular writer who, who was writing almost a century ago. Um, that, that's one challenge. And then the second challenge is sometimes the value systems, the cultural values that they're writing about, cultural norms, don't necessarily sit well with me as a 21st century writer but I want to be fair to their work and, and their intentions. And so I try to make sure I'm doing a good job, even if I don't agree with it. Um, and then as far as which do I prefer, I think I like, I, I think in my case, both, both practices support each other. Being a writer of short stories helps me translate short stories because I understand the form, I understand the techniques and the craft and vice versa, being a translator helps me when I go to my own writing and editing because I start nitpicking and being very careful and choosy about my words and phrases because of the way I translate. And so I think it complements. Mm. Awesome, yeah. thank you. So there's some questions here about kind of the larger things that we do as literary citizens. So Mimi, there's just a question, maybe you can answer it quickly about if, if you can talk a little bit about Voice of Witness. 
Yes, yeah, so um, the nonprofit that I co-founded many, many years ago, uh, Voice of Witness, it's uh, based in San Francisco and its mission is to amplify marginalized voices. And we do this through collections of books that are based on oral testimonies of people impacted by injustice with a focus on the criminal justice system and migration and displacement. And we do educational program work as well. And I think there is something that um, that's very similar between an anthology of edited oral histories and fiction stories because they are they are ultimately a way to immerse yourself and to um, understand a specific world through multiple perspectives and then having that having whatever your preconceived notions were about a certain issue or a certain uh, group of people or a certain um, community uh, having that thinking complicated in a good way and you know enriched and you know have nuanced added to it so our most recent book is how we go home voices from indigenous north america and um and it's absolutely fantastic and it came out just last month and we're getting ready for a second printing it's just i think the you know to what you were saying jenny about going virtual not by, by choice but it offering so many opportunities to connect with people or to have people participate in your conversations around your book and to meet you are um, are really fantastic, and that's what we've seen with um, with releasing that book during this during these pandemic times. Okay, um, there's a question for me about being the managing editor of Kaya and what kind of work I look out for. So Kaya Press is a an independent publisher that publishes Asian diasporic literature. So very much about what we're talking about here today. So we're we're looking for innovative, uh, cutting edge work from Asian diasporic voices, uh, very much like Mimi's book and, and also uh, like Jenny's book. And Jenny's book was published by 713 Press, which is an, another independent press that I love and support. So just, you know, uh, do take a moment to check out independent presses, especially 713 and Kaya and, and support independent literature at this time. It's, it's where some of this really exciting work is coming out. All right, I think we have time for one more question. So one question here is, uh, you know, how important is, you know, the your focus on you know, your background as opposed to your focus on writing Chica asks. So, you know, maybe you guys can lead us out with this question. What is the the balance between, you know, your your identities and, you know, what what gets put on the page? Mimi, you want to you want to start that? Sure. Um, I never start a story thinking I want to write about my background. I think your background cannot help but inform your worldview, how you see the world, how you understand the world, but then how, the, also the distance that you put between your, also you have multiple backgrounds, right? So um, culturally, but also in terms of time as well. So I feel like background is layered and background I think to me, is just another word for the context in which you, you were born, the context in which you, now live and that cannot help but end up in your voice and in what you put on the page and so yeah. my short answer is don't sweat it it will come through <laughs> yeah i i don't i agree with mimi i don't specifically say i'm going to write about this most of the stories in my collection were written while i was in india and and really what i write about is what's keeping me up at night and so when I was in India and I was seeing the things happening around me, whether it was related to caste or class or gender, those were the things that were keeping me up at night. And that's what came through in my stories. My novel now, I'm, I'm in the US right now. So my novel is more focused on the issues that are keeping me up here. So it's not so much, for me, it's not so much the background as much as um, what's keeping me up at night, but also as Mimi rightly said, it's all layered in because you write from your sensibility, and that comes from your life experiences. Great. Um, I think this is, I just wanted to, you know, 
say thank you so much to, to everyone, to, to Jenny, uh, especially and to Mimi for being in conversation and just, you know, a, a big reminder to, to seek out these books um, and, and tell your friends about them, Each of Us Killers and Last of Our Name. Um, and, uh, you know, so wonderful to start, start off the morning being in conversation with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and congrats on your book, Jenny. Can't can't wait to oh, read thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jenny Bott, Mimi Locke, for such a thoughtful conversation, and thank you, Neil Anjana Banerjee, for being an amazing moderator today. This session was presented by Indiaspora. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available through Brazos Bookstore and Full Circle. And once again, we would like to thank all of our advisors, donors, and partners for their generous support. Special thanks to Hari and Anjali Anjala Agrawal, Durga and Sushila Agrawal, Ashid and Shazna Mateen, Ann Chow, Bela Jane, and Dr. Shaila and Sumant Patel. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and we'll tune in for our next session, the end of October, Lawrence Wright, in conversation with Omar el Akkad at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 10.30 p.m. India Standard Time. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading by Rana Khan from the Jaipur Writers Shorts, Shorts series. The title of my poem comes from a question most commonly asked of immigrants. Where are you from, really? I'm from Varanasi, India, a country ancient and wise, but lately cursed with warring godheads, uh, fractured people and their histories. I'm also from Aligarh, India, where the college campus seduced me with ideas old and new. And it was there besides the red brick wall covered with yellow roses that love finally claimed me. I'm also from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where time stands still and the landscape of black clad women and white clad men gives no succor. My two babies born here carry a stigma forever in their passports. Who knew then of a certain date in September? I'm also from Dubai, United Arab Emirates, the city of magical dreams built by the unsung who toiled in the merciless sun, a place corrupted by money and many, its charms seem tired even to itself. Lately though, I'm from Toronto, Canada, joining thousands of others in search of new destinies, nameless, faceless, yet identified by our struggles to make this new country our own. Yes, I'm from all this and more. I'm from parents who died too early and of love that still sings across the oceans. But a question for you, my friend, where I'm from, does it matter when it is where I'm going that preoccupies me most days? I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library, or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life.
about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF co coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Jaipur Literature Festival is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers, and literary agents Work Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavor of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalao Tsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzy. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. 
the Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Art so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information Visit www.teamworkarts.com You know, I don't think we really create community so much as provide a space for community to evolve. What Imprint does is offer a space where you can easily integrate reading and literature and writing into your everyday life. For 38 seasons, we've presented nearly 400 of the great writers, winners of every major award from 35 countries, an inclusive array of voices and styles in a series accessible to all. Thank you for accompanying us on the journey. I'm glad to be here to celebrate with you the wonder of a big room full of people who love books. To have a truly just and equal society, at least when it comes to storytelling representation, means that we have many, many voices from many, many different experiences. I really enjoy reading out loud. I really enjoy being read to. It's a bit of a parenthesis in our very hectic, fast, noisy, everyday. When I was growing up, you were a black kid. There were two stereotypes about you. You were going to be the coolest kid in the room, or the toughest kid in the room. But the truth is, we're also weirdos. We get to be weirdos too. It's important that you know that everybody deserves the opportunity to be as strange and weird as they want to be. They're reading on their own. They're starting to value what a book means to them. And so to then meet the author, ask questions, get a book signed by the author, it can be a really inspiring thing for a kid that age. This is my path, but I want to make sure that the path is as wide as a highway for you. Whatever your dream is, your dreams can come true. Because I know they came true for me. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Would you like a poem? Yes. Yeah, what do you want a poem about? Um, daylight like savings. Well, the Imprint Poetry Buskers were created to take poetry out into the streets via poets armed with typewriters. Writing poems by request on whatever topic people would dream up. 
It's great for the poets, they get to exercise their chops, but it also is a miracle for the recipient of these poems. A poem that's written for them is the first time that's ever happened to them. The sky was big and pink this morning, the first morning of a new part of the year, when we all woke up earlier than we used to. How do we balance both the writing that we do with all the other things we focus in on as well? You have to find the rhythm that works for you. I always feel like people want like the magic.